This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. Okay, listen carefully. I'm saying that you may understand that Jesus is the savior of your soul. You may have a good understanding that he paid your sin debt and that you've received him as Lord and savior. But somewhere along the line, you've never really understood what it is to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me want to dance and sing with every single breath I bring. I will bring this offering. You are my wonder, you with the wonder. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. Welcome back to Today with Jeff Fines. My name's Aaron, and we're bringing you the final part of our final message in our series titled Pursuing Jesus. Last time, we started this message from Pastor Jeff looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 2. If you missed part one, you can catch up by listening to it wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Today with Jeff Fines. This passage is titled Gifts for the Building of the Temple. It's about a time when King David was pursuing God with all of his heart and gave all he had in order to build a temple that would honor God. Pastor Jeff is asking us the question, are we meant to do the same? Let's rejoin him now as he unpacks the rest of this scripture. There's another question that comes out of 1 Chronicles 29. David built a house for God as an expression of his acknowledgement that everything he has in his position comes from God and that God is to be glorified among the nations. But what about us? Are we supposed to build a big edifice for God? No, that's not our calling. That's very clear in the New Testament. What have we been called to do? What are you and I supposed to do? With what have we been charged? How are we supposed to invest God's resources? I want to take you to something Jesus said in Luke 16, 9 that is seldom talked about. And Jesus makes this statement. Let me read it for you. I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fall or fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, that's a very confusing passage, especially this word mammon. What is mammon? You know, what is that? It sounds like bad manna. Hey, that manna's bad, don't eat that. Looks like mammon to me. What is mammon? Well, the understanding of this Greek uh, uh, phrase, it's more of a phrase than a word, unrighteous mammon. It means that money is usually in one of two categories, okay? There is the money that is submitted to God and his purposes, and that has the spirit of God on it. So it multiplies, it cannot be devoured or consumed by the enemy, and it stores up heavenly treasures, it's incorruptible. But then there is the money that's used as a substitute for God and therefore has the spirit of mammon, unrighteousness on it. It will be destroyed, unprotected, it will be devoured and consumed. So read the, per, the, the passage again, read the verse again, Luke 16, 9. And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. What is that? That when you fail, they receive you, they may receive you into an everlasting home. So here's the meaning of the text is, use the money you get from a world system that is unrighteous. You and I have to work, we have to make a living. Things are not always righteous and good. We're supposed to be people of integrity and live a righteous and good life. But the money itself is only redeemed when it is used for God's purposes. And he says, use your money in this world system, this unrighteous mammon, use it to make friends who will receive you into an everlasting home. Now, what what eternal home? What friends are gonna receive us into an eternal home? And here's what Jesus says. 
Use money to bring people far from God, near to God, and they will be your welcoming committee into an everlasting home. I love this idea. I love this kind of thinking. It's almost as if God is saying, when you get to heaven, there's gonna be two parades. In the first parade, God is the spectator. And all of those people who gave their lives to Jesus, who recognized in their humility that everything they had belonged to God and that they were in opposition to God because of their sin, but they recognized that Jesus was that ultimate sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God and brings them into community, into relationship. All of the people who received the Son and who entered into relationship and who passionately pursued the Son, they're gonna be on parade. They're the trophies of Christ, those whom he paid their debt for whom he paid the debt. And now it's like there's a big parade and they're marching through the, through the golden streets. I know it's not really golden streets, but marching through the city of God. But then there's a second parade. And that second parade, you and I are the spectators. And we get to stand and watch all of those people who were far from God, who came near to God because of our investment, because of our generosity, because of our sacrifice, ultimately because of the work of Jesus. But had we not sacrificed and given above and beyond for a purpose that is greater than ourselves, there will be people who will not be in this parade. I go back and say what I did before. When God gets your heart, really gets your heart, your greatest joy comes as a result of giving yourself to God and his purposes in the world. And I want to tell you, I can't, that's going to be an emotional parade. And you say, but Jeff, what is God's primary purpose then? I mean, what is he after? Is it benevolence? No. Benevolence is a good thing, but it's often the means to the end. The end goal is always salvation, to bring those far from God near. How are you investing the very best of you, what is most precious to you, to get that job done? Now, why would anyone change after they hear a message like this? Because as I said before, going up and shouting to a dead tree and saying, bear fruit, and expecting it to bear fruit is impossible. There has to be a transformation. The heart if, if you don't have a spirit, a feeling of generosity and sacrifice to give the very best of who you are to the purposes of God, I'm concerned that your heart has not yet been transformed. Some of you will say, Jeff, you can't say that. I didn't. Jesus did. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let me paraphrase. Your most precious possessions will go to the thing that you love the most. So the real question in all of this is, what are you most passionate about? Just be honest. What do you enjoy most? You know, Pastor Steve loves to ride his bike. And I'm sure soon he's going to take the training wheels off, but he really likes to ride his bike. In fact, actually, Steve has won quite a few races. He, he's quite a sprinter. He actually showed me a video once of him racing and leading the pack, and he had these huge thighs. It's too bad the muscle has gone to the tummy now, but he wants it. there's a time he had huge, huge thighs. Roy loves to coach baseball. He loves to have his baseball hat on. He's a great dad, man. Roy loves to hang out with his kids, coach baseball. That's what he loves to do. Dale loves to ride bikes. He, he, he's not a racer though. He's more of a, where, where, where Steve's a sprinter, I think Dale's more of a marathoner on a bicycle. He just gets it and goes forever. It's like the Energizer Bunny just keeps on going. The point is the thought of getting to do these things to Steve and to Dell and to Roy brings joy. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. God grants us wonderful gifts in life. In fact, golf is his most desired gift and most pleasant gift. But, what the, but the question is, what is the primary goal? You see, don't, don't think that you can't have excitement and fun and enjoyment in life. I mean, right now I would love to be in Cabo just soaking up the sun rays. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be somewhere that you just really enjoy. But what is the primary goal of your life? What are you truly chasing after ultimately? Now, I didn't ask you what it should be. I don't want you to get all spiritual, more spiritual than you ought to be. For most of us, it's a dollar figure or career position or the master of particular skill. Where is your heart? Man, I, I can't leave this without giving you this kind of understanding. What, 
What are you going after? Because wherever you're going after, you're going to be amazed. You're going to be amazed at what you're able to do. I have always, for instance, been impressed with the workout schedules of Olympians. I've mentioned Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympian of all time, 22 Olympic medals over three Olympics. Remember when I shared his workout routine? Six hours a day, six days a week. Even if a workout day falls on Christmas day, he's in the pool, he's working out in the gym, he's running on the track. He swims 50 miles, 80 kilometers every week. That's eight miles a day. I don't know how many of you know of Ashley Barty. She's Australia's number one tennis player. In fact, earlier this year, she was the number one uh, tennis player in the world. I looked up her workout regimen. It's amazing. 45 minutes of stretching, one hour of cardio, two hours on the court, a quick lunch, two hours of weights, one hour conditioning, one hour rehab, one hour on the court session to work out the kinks. Nine hours every single day. Now, here's the question. Why do they do it? You say, well, because they have to. Wrong answer. There have been incredible documents that record that those people who are gifted in a certain or particular sport who do what they do because they have to end up sooner or later dropping out and doing something else. They do it because they love it. They, Phelps loves to be in the pool. I, yes. Ashley Barty loves to be on the court, in the gym. Yes. There is almost always a correlation between super talented people, their love, and the degree of their success and failure. A lot of super talented people don't succeed. Why? Because they don't love it. Their parents are living vicariously through them. They feel they have to do it to represent their family or townspeople, or maybe they're even doing it to pursue fame but they don't love it. And if they don't love it, they fall short. And that's why I have taken a different approach to these tough issues by asking, where is your heart? Where's your heart? Now, this is the end of the message. It's very important. Saying, Pastor Jeff, are you saying that I'm not saved? Okay, listen carefully. I'm saying that you may understand that Jesus is the savior of your soul. You may have a good understanding that he paid your sin debt and that you've received him as Lord and savior. But somewhere along the line, you've never really understood what it is to make Jesus the Lord of your life. One or two options remain. If you're the kind of person, one, you're listening to this, and uh, you said, you know what? I, I just don't need this. I, I can't wait till this is over. I'll come back when there's a better series. Or if you're really nervous and you're fidgeting because you know you don't live up, but you, 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 you don't have any intention of making any changes. You just want to get out of here as fast as you can. Then I'm telling you, when giving or tithing is an obligation, it never worked for very long. It has to come as a natural byproduct of something that happened in your heart where you began to understand for the first time the depths that God was willing to go to to rescue somebody like you who was far from God to bring them near. But there is a weakness to this theory because sometimes all you need to do, you're you're where you ought to be. You actually get all this stuff and all you need to do is enact your will. Look carefully at this passage written by C.S. Lewis. It's called Compound Interest. This is how it goes. The worldly man treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian trying to treat everyone kindly finds himself liking more and more people as he goes, including people he could not even imagine himself liking at the beginning. This same spiritual law works terribly in the opposite direction. The Germans, perhaps, at first ill-treated the Jews because they hated them. Afterwards, they hated them much more because they had ill-treated them. Do you hear what he's saying? When you are cruel to someone, and then you see them at a later time. You're even more cruel. Do you know why? Because now you're angry at the guilt you feel every time you see them. So you're even more cruel and there is more hatred. He goes on, the more cruel you are, the more you will hate, the more cruel you will become and so on in a vicious circle forever. Then the famous quote from mere Christianity, good and evil both increase at compound interest. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. 
The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later, you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. An apparently trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or railway line or bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. You know what he's saying? He's saying, when you don't feel like it, do what is right. And when you do what is right, you'll start to feel like it. If you cease giving, you will want to give even less as time goes by. But if you start giving somewhere, you will actually want to give more as time goes on. Enact the will and the heart will soon follow. Folks, I believe, you know, I was filling out a, a report this week and it, it asked the question of state. You know, what state are you from? And I scrolled down and I found California. Something interesting happened. When I clicked on California, there was a real pride in me. Yeah, California. I realized, man, I love California. What? You love California with all the... I can't explain it. Yeah, I know it's got problems. Everybody has problems, but I... I love it here. And I think part of my love here is because God's called me here. Somebody asked me the other day, are, are you gonna leave California? I mean, things are a mess. Are you gonna go somewhere else like Texas or Tennessee? And I thought, that, I thought, man, do you really think that I base my decision on where I'm gonna live on, on an emotion like that? This is where I'm called. I mean, if I, if I flee now, what does that say about me? That I'm about me that I'm not about God. I'm not saying that if you moved away, you're not about God, you're about you. For me, in this position, in my calling, God tells me where to be. Can I tell you something though, for those of you who have remained in California? Our best days are ahead. There's been a sifting in the Christian West. I hate the pandemic and I hate what it's done and I hate the suffering. But I've looked around and I've realized it's been a great thing to separate the wheat from the chaff. Those who have been on the fringe where church has never been something important or building the kingdom of God on earth has never been important. We'll see more and more of what we call fringe people fading away. Now, I'm not happy about that. I'm not. Because anybody this far from God, I want to bring near. But I also see that the core, those who yearn for worship and community and to do something that matters with their life, they've leaned harder in to church and to the people of God. And every week I meet new families. I'm so excited on every campus. I mean, this past weekend I was at the Rancho campus and I met a young lady by the name of Genesis. And she told me her story. It was a great story. She said that she and her daughter live up in the high desert. It's about 40 minutes away, but they come down to the Rancho campus. And they said they do so because they were going through a very difficult period in their lives. And her daughter especially had some pretty serious questions and somebody gave her this book called Dinner with Skeptics. Now, when she said that, oh, wow. Somebody gave her the book Dinner with Skeptics. She read it. It changed her. It changed her mom. And suddenly she called her mom and said, mom, because she knew her mom had been praying for it. Mom, I found this book. It's changed everything. And her mom said, that's my preacher. And she invited her to Rancho. And she started to come into Rancho. And my conversation with her fired me up. Because if that's the kind of people God is sending us, give me a thousand Genesis. Because she doesn't come to one and all because it's flashy or she likes the pastor or the music is hip. No, I stood and I talked with her and you could tell she's there because she wants to be part of a church that is reaching their community for Christ. She wants to be part of a community who loves their neighbors, even the ones who disagree with them. I'll take a thousand more like that. Philip Yancey, one of my favorite authors, and I'll close with this. He wrote something that I think speaks volumes to us, but also reveals our heart. He says, along with many other Christians, I wince at the snidely jubilant tone that often characterizes media coverage of scandals among Christians. See, these Christians are no better. No, they're worse than the rest of us, they say. I grieve, says Yancey, over reports that contributions to almost all Christian organizations decline dramatically in the wake of each new scandal. I consider my gifts to Christian organizations as the highest returning investment I can possibly make. And then he goes on to say, maybe, maybe one problem underlying the scandals of Christian superstars is that we distort the kingdom of God by training our spotlight, not on the servants, but on the stars. 
as Henri Nouwen said, keep your eyes on the one who refused to turn stones into bread, jump from great heights, or rule with great temporal power. Keep your eyes on the one who says, blessed are the poor, the gentle, those who mourn and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the peacemakers, and those who are persecuted in the cause of uprightness. Keep your eyes on the one who is poor with the poor, weak with the weak, and rejected with the rejected. That one is the source of all peace. In other words, keep your eyes on the servant, not the superstar. And then he finishes by saying, the gospels repeat one saying of Jesus more than any other. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Truly, the way up is down. I don't want to build huge gaps between our church and those who disagree with us. I don't want to be a wall builder. I want to be a bridge builder. And I want to build that bridge when they see our kindness and sacrifice and generosity. But I also realize the only way I'll be that type of person is if I, like David, have pursued Jesus for most of my life. And in pursuing him, I have met him. And in meeting him, I now desire to become most like him. And I am most like him when I give the very best to the very least. My question to you after you hear this message, will you be part of the one and all parade? Will you join the ranks? Thus showing that your treasure the thing you most deeply care about, the thing that you're most passionate about is not stockpiling or hoarding or gaining more wealth, but gaining more wealth in order to give it away. As Jesus left his home in glory and all the riches of heaven and became a servant and gave what was most precious to him, his life, that those far from God might come near, I pray that you would join the ranks of people at one and all who are doing the same. Father, thank you for the power of First Chronicles 29. What a great example of David, even, even though he had so many failures in his life, so many sins, so many seasons of rebellion that the last 40 or so years of his life, his eyes were open and he came to understand that this world truly has nothing of eternal value to offer us. But there is something that we can spend our resources on that will not darken or fade, that will not rust, that are indeed incorruptible. People who are far from God that will come near to the presentation of the gospel and the generosity of the saints. In Christ's name, amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. But there is a step of faith, almost a leap of faith required once you become a, a Christian, a believer. You know what that is? It's this, that when the rug is pulled out from under you, when your life is not going in the direction that you think it should have gone, when nothing seems to be going your way, the Bible tells us that we are to be a people who no matter what the situation looks on the outside, that we're supposed to believe that God is sovereign, that he is on the throne, and he's still as much involved in your life as he's ever been. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Fines wherever you listen to podcasts. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.